Shall I yes. open yes, this please. interesting discussion? <laughs> 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 We're looking at each other. <laughs> Who is going to start? <laughs> so I guess uh, the decorum is not visible for whoever is listening to us, but it's quite interesting to be in the underground of the museum. And uh, my name is Stéphane Duguin. I'm the chief executive officer for the Cyber Peace Institute in Geneva. Uh, I've been told to give some words of background. So I'll start like this, quickly, civil servant for most of my career, uh, with, I would say, after so many years, we can say an obsession of supporting victims of crime, and now the crime is uh, in the cyberspace, so that's what I do for a living, and helping the one the most vulnerable against the worst of the attack, and I guess we can start with that. Great. I am Katerina Riva and uh, I am maybe the odd one out <laughs> um, with the word we're discussing together tonight, which is hacker. So um, I'm gonna give a little um, autobiographical introduction. I'm currently the director of a museum in Termoli, southern Italy, called MACTE, Museo di Arte Contemporanea di Termoli. I've been there for a year. So, yeah, with the challenges of uh, what the last year has been. And before then, uh, although I'm Italian, I worked and lived abroad. Um, I was in Singapore for two years. I was working for the Institute of Contemporary Art Singapore, um, whose uh, acronym is ICA. And it's really funny because if you do a quick Google search on ICA Singapore, it sends you to the link of uh, the Immigration Authority. <laughs> 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 so, and I think also when I first arrived, I made a mistake of linking uh, I don't know, my social media to that, and then someone pointed out <laughs> that <laughs> I was redirecting maybe to where I didn't want to be. Um, also, um, those two years in Singapore, I have to say, really changed a little bit my outtake on uh, how digital life has been changing everything, uh, and in particular, trying to address how it's changing uh, the production of artworks and how artists and curators work. Um, also, being in Singapore, I experienced firsthand uh, um, a kind of, uh, I guess, constrictive uh, government and technological uh, experiments uh, being uh, taken out on uh, on population, so that made me a little bit scared as a citizen of the world. Um, and um, also, mm, before Singapore, I spent uh, three years in Auckland, New Zealand, as the director of uh, a contemporary art space called Art Space, um, which again was a really interesting opportunity to um, encounter a very far away and very layered post colonial community that taught me a lot about being elsewhere and uh, working uh, with the uh, different audiences and maybe challenging a bit our Eurocentric ways of thinking. And, um, and going back a little bit more in time, I um, studied and worked in London where I did an MFA in curating at Goldsmiths. And uh, I, at the same time, I opened a mm, curatorial project space with two colleagues called Form Content. And we did projects there in real life, because I guess uh, we had a website, but maybe <laughs> things weren't as, uh, as dematerialized as they seem to be now. So yeah, I mean, um, maybe uh, before passing on, I just would like to say that uh, maybe, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm here also to learn and um, yeah, maybe bring my own kind of outsider Oops. look and, <laughs> and perspective to the conversation. Hi, uh, my name is Patrice Wiemans. If Katerina is uh, odd person out, I may be the odd person in <laughs> with, uh, with emphasis on odd because uh, I'm supposed and considered to be a hacker. Uh, my background is uh, very simple. I've been uh, academic for the major part of my life. I'm a geographer, and, uh, but I switched quite uh, early from geography into the uh, 
uh, electronic networks, as it was called in the time, which became for the general public the internet, which is much older than many people s believe, because many people would date the internet from the 90s, and uh, ev uh, maybe even later. But in anyway, I'm uh, uh, I became internet and especially uh, 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 cult uh, cultural and <laughs> especially internet activist. And I've been part of uh, many events, generally in uh, in a peripheral uh, position because I don't like to be uh, I don't like to be at the top of things. Say I much prefer to be a kind of observer. But maybe the most imp important thing for now, since the theme is hacker, is that I might surprise people in the sense that I'm, uh, as I often say, I'm not a, I'm a hacker, but I'm not a coder. And the most important point that I want to make, because it is, uh, in my opinion, the beginning of a lot of misunderstanding. However, hackers are very much connected to uh, 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 information and communication technology, as it is called, or say the internet, the electronic networks, and the technology which supports it all. It's in my view, and in the view of uh, uh, I'm happy to say quite a number of hackers uh, connect connection to the uh, to the uh, to IT is never uh, necessary and especially not a sufficient condition to be a hacker. To be a hacker is a question of, again in my view, of attitude, of habitus, of way of doing. And uh, uh, I will uh, I will start the conversation with uh, saying that. The main characteristic of somebody who would will be considered a, a, a hacker is to be curious. Mm -hmm. That curiosity is the most important thing. And a lot of things go with it, uh, with always uh, keeping in mind that, as the proverb say, curiosity killed the cat. <laughs> Great. Um I wonder if uh, we want to establish also maybe some kind of ground for uh, what a hacker is or if we want to jump in other directions because uh, yeah there's kind of the standard definition but I'm personally quite interested in the characterization or should I say of the mischaracterization of, uh, of this uh, figure and maybe this kind of disembodied nature being mm -hmm. one of the the main main points and i wonder maybe if you can help me also understand maybe a different basic difference between a hacker and a cracker if there's like a different attitude as you say patrice well the uh, uh <laughs> when you are talking about misunderstanding maybe the most important one if uh, uh in the olden days, uh, quite early on, there was this uh, 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 make the differentiation between a hacker and a cracker. A hacker is a good person, <laughs> or a white hacker. A uh, cracker is a bad person, doing bad things, which uh, you are combating. And uh, uh, in my view, it's as quite often, it's absurdly simple. A cracker is not a hacker. A hacker works according to the hacker ethics, which is quite well defined, and which says, do no harm. Mm -hmm. In the beginning time of hacking, well, first, maybe it's, it's good to know that uh, the word hack and hacking, which apparently, but I'm not very sure of that, uh, but apparently uh, originated in the MIT, the Massachusetts yeah. uh, Institute of Technology, was just coding, was just about uh, 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 making computer works, mm -hmm. which at that time was really a kind of pioneering, was a kind of pioneering activity with very little uh, being, yeah, you were creating, you were creating knowledge as you were going. That had a very important feature, that knowledge was absolutely open. It was shared and it was open. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the internet came out of that mm -hmm. and one of the maybe uh, uh, most uh, uh, crucial problem of the internet as we know it today is this, you would al almost say, original sin that it was open. 
and it's built to be open. Mm. And when uh, uh, all kinds of bad things started to happen, of which crackers are part, but uh, also the commercialization and financialization of the internet and trying to make things secret again uh, uh, was always a kind of mending. Yeah, uh, 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 you can use all kinds of metaphors like, uh, like uh, 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 how you call it, soaping the floor with, uh <laughs> with a mop while <laughs> there's a lot of water flying uh, coming in. So uh, um, hackers in the beginning were, were, uh, uh, was, simply, was simply coding. And then it evolved. It evolved for a very important reason, is that uh, uh, MIT saw that. The, this open knowledge closed in. It closed in for various reasons, the most important one being commercialization. And, commerciali and, and commerce is, of course, based, I think wrongly, but it's the way it works, on secrecy, yeah. on, uh, on uh, proprietary knowledge. IPR. You want to... Uh, no, 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 just, okay. no, just what you're saying, on IPR, I mean, the basis of uh, commerce, you have IPR. Uh, exactly. Uh, and IPR is, uh, is, is exactly what, uh, uh, what hackers are coming into. The second thing what hackers are doing is gaining access. Uh, if the thing is open, you don't... Gaining access is easy. You just, you just take access. But if it's closed, you have to gain access for some way or another. And there, says, uh, the problem started. Uh, hackers were gaining access illegally. Uh, illegally because uh, uh, the what they wanted to gain access to, networks, was closed. And then in quite early in the beginning, kind of, of, uh, of uh, 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 war, say, or conflict, uh, started to happen between hackers. Young people, generally. At that time, hackers were really very young. I, I, I was with uh, Dutch hackers since the beginning almost the beginning. They started uh, outside Amsterdam, which is quite remarkable in itself, because in, uh, in, in the Netherlands, everything is uh, supposed to happen in Holland. Uh, in Holland, everything is supposed to happen in Amsterdam. But they came from uh, a bit north, and they were 15, something like 15, 16, when they, they came to the open, and <laughs> to Amsterdam, by the way, when they were something like 1920, and that's when, that, that's when I joined them, a bit by accident. And um, and um, yeah, they interacted with their main 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 uh, aim. Main goal was to get gain access to networks, which were closed. And at that time, there were government networks, academic networks. Commercial came in there. That's also, I think, an important point that commerce came into the internet relatively late. Uh, uh, one of the uh, of, of the things Bill Gates is remote to have said that the internet was a fad and it will it will pass away like uh, so many things. Well, you see where we are where we are now. So in the beginning it was all all and when the Dutch hackers came into the network, they were uh, combated for for part but also admired by uh, and they got quite early access on agreement with uh, the main academics uh, network and and. From their own, at least in the Netherlands, uh, 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 a kind of modus vivendi uh, 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 came into being. I am speaking of the very late 80s and early 90s, huh, by the way. In Italy, for instance, things were completely different. Hackers from the beginning were seen uh, as, uh, as an evil force. And in Italy, they were much more radical than they were, politically speaking, than they were in the Netherlands. So in, uh, in g Europe, generally, you can, uh, uh, as far as hackers are concerned, you can make a difference between the North and the South, in the sense that the South was uh, early uh, militant and, uh, and got into really severe repression from the state, whether in the North a kind of compromise evolved in the Netherlands, especially because the hack we had in the Netherlands a very early computer criminality laws, and the hackers uh, uh, um, uh, profiled themselves as a social movement. By profiling themselves as a social mm -hmm. movement, they became a bit uh, uh, inattackable. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you don't touch social movement. Social movements are okay. So as long as they were not engaging in criminality, that was, that was quite all right. To come back to this, uh, to what are hackers doing, um, 
there are several stages. You have hackers uh, doing, for instance, uh, 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 acting like criminal hackers in the help of making systems secure. This is a very, this is a very positive, uh, uh, quite often not very much knowledge. Very difficult to add knowledge because uh, uh, unless they have been hired in by uh, the institution, company or government or whatever, indeed to probe their network for for uh, uh, for failures, for uh, uh, how you call it, for uh vulnerabilities. L exactly, vulnerabilities. vulnerabilities. If they do it by themselves and then signal uh, to the instances that uh, uh, they have this and that vulnerability. Nowadays, there's some kind of protocol for that, but in the early days, it was really kind of, uh, oh, bad weather is coming, let's smash the barometer. Or, uh, uh <laughs> <laughs> this messenger is telling me my, my armies have been <laughs> smashed up, let's kill the messenger. And uh, so, a lot of difficulties arose of that. Um, and then, yes, you have the whole, and that was one, uh, quite a few words, Lara, the uh, Lara, the artist, uh, uh, suggested phishing, spam, random ransomware, and so. I'm not really, uh, 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 to put it bluntly, I'm not very interested in that. That's not ac that's not hacker activity for me. That's criminal activity, making use of computers with having a knowledge, which is unfortunately the same as what real hackers have, knowledge of system. I'm much more interested in that position of the knowledge because one of the uh, to me one of the uh, uh, um, major aspect of b being a hacker and that's not only for it it's for technology in general and for knowledge in general hacker is someone who is in the possession of an illegal or let me say unauthorized knowledge in a certain sense we are back in the egyptian times the high priest has the knowledge, they are authorized to have it. Anyone else who has this knowledge is by definition criminal. And I like no, to that's that. Yeah. I mean, you said a lot and that's very interesting. The um, I'll start with the end when you said knowledge. I mean, that's uh, to, to me, hacking, at least how I understand this, and I guess how the vast majority of uh, people looking at the topic understand this. First, there's no negative uh, yeah, connotation to the word, and that's uh, it's too bad that now it's become a bit more uh, vulgar uh, through article via bad description of event that uh, hackers are described when in fact we're talking about criminals. But for me, it has nothing to do with hacking. For me, hacking is really something that is about knowledge, that is about empowerment of citizens to understand the system they interact with. It's like we are interacting with a system, we are interacting with an ecosystem. We should be, as human beings, in capacity to understand what is happening, how it works, and if it doesn't work to our interest, to make it better. And that was really at the source of the of the philosophy, because it's, it's, it's really to go in towards the philosophy, the hacking. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a way of our life, the way of seeing your environment, though I've been critic about your environment. To me, linked to hacking, there's a lot of... Uh, high sense of self-critic, uh, defense against manipulation, defense against uh, uh, factory of information that is trying to make you act in a way that you don't even know why you're acting like this. So hacking is about, you know, going against that. So keeping your brain up and trying to look uh, into the, the cracks in between the code. Um, something that you said, and I absolutely subscribe to this, then whatever else you do, using a computer, using a knife, using a car, using a bomb, using uh, whatever, it's crime. But it has nothing to do with hacking. So that would be the same that you would say that, I don't know, a, a, a race driver is, uh, is a nice person when he's driving a race, and when someone is using a car, you know, to break the rules on the road, suddenly it's a criminal, and then we have to define this, and uh, because the car is the same car. No, it does mm -hmm. this doesn't make any sense. Um, the something that you you, men you mentioned also about power, uh, but yeah, yeah, you didn't mention power, but it, it it led me to think about power and knowledge because the I don't remember who it was. I think it was Zimmerman, but help me there. Uh, I don't want to say uh, nonsense, but uh, if uh, people are listening to us, they will correct. <laughs> I think it was sure. Zimmerman who uh, the first time put in place the PGP, 
Mm -hmm. And uh, at the moment where uh, this was known from his friend, from his network, uh, they told him, watch out, because for sure the FBI is going to come on you, because what you're doing now is nothing illegal, but because you're doing it and it was supposed to be something that was owned by the state, says who? The state. Then something <laughs> is going to happen to you. And yeah, no surprise, the FBI came, uh, came, 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 yeah. came there. Yeah. When today, Decades after that, yeah. encryption is at the basis of yeah. all the services that we have on the internet. Without encryption, we cannot yeah. uh, secure yeah. the exchange in finance, we cannot secure the... Uh, I mean, I don't mm -hmm. have to explain why it's so important. So it's also a question of momentum. And if at that time, that person with the hacker philosophy, state of mind and approach would not, you know, go into the boundaries of, uh, I want to make sure that encryption become a public good, then maybe it would never, never have been, you know, happening for the vast uh, majority of us. So at some point you need to play, as you were saying, with the, with the boundary, with the rules, and to be there. But if you do this for knowledge, if it's transparent, if it's open, if it's really for the common good, if you don't do this for ego, you know, and to prove that you're better than the system and you want to beat something, because sometimes it also can, yeah, can yeah, go there. Yeah. Uh, and as long as we don't mix this with crime, and it's quite easy to define crime. So maybe it's more complicated to define hacking, but it's very easy to define crime. So maybe yeah. it's, you know, it's easier <laughs> to go there. <laughs> um, we w th that's where we uh, at least uh, see the... Um, that's where I see this in, uh, in my, uh, yeah, in my mind construct, the hacking. The, uh, the interesting point about uh, encryption is that uh, um, you first had a stage where you were fighting for the right to encrypt and nowadays we have the stage, which basically in my mind came in uh, uh, after one after nine eleven. The you are you have to fight for the f for the right to decrypt. Yeah. Yeah. Well I mean, we can talk about this, but it's so. Uh, I mean, this is this is, a <laughs> this is a you opened a lot of very good conversations. So there's one about encryption. There's one about vulnerability uh, scanning and bug bounty. When uh, in some countries, if you do this, you're still criminalized. And uh, you even have to, you know, to have the permission to make sure that you're going to detect a vulnerability in a system that, if it's exploited, is going to trigger the mass surveillance of millions of people. And because you're looking into that, you need to ask, sorry, can I have the, uh, the permission? Please don't put me in jail. So it's kind of a crazy situation. Uh, encryption is the same. I mean, uh, but okay, w w we, we, we can discuss about this afterwards, but happy to come back to it. <laughs> Um, I think there are so many interesting things on the table. <laughs> um, I'm really interested as well in this question of ethics uh, that I think uh, you also are both really interested in. And Sorry. maybe one, one way we can go about this is also open a more like a geopolitical um, kind of landscape mm -hmm. because uh, I realize we often make the mistake of of thinking as you know one word one internet but uh, things do change yeah. quite drastically depending on yeah. which point of view you look you look uh, at them from um, and i'm also thinking um, of um, yeah kind of uh, very like simple artistic examples as well um, like uh, aaron schwartz uh, i'm sure you are familiar with uh, his name um was commissioned when he was still alive uh, uh, to uh, mm, propose an artwork with the, um, another New York based artist called Tarin Simon and they came up with this uh, quite interesting index of uh, um, the same word how it's visualized on browsers in different places so let's say the word peace I don't know, I, I don't have the visual reference on me now, but for example, is a, is a dove with an olive branch in one country and it's uh, a woman uh, with a flag in another one, depending mm. on religious, gender, rules, etc. Um, the other aspect I'm super interested in, and to me is a crux in this discussion and why I'm kind of interested in also this kind of digital surveillance, what's, what's happening to us, is this idea of ob obfuscation. And to me, power lies with the ones that know how to use certain things and all the rest of us are left with, uh, you know, clicking blindly on cookies uh, because yeah. uh, we're too tired to read the fine prints. And that's how, you know, things um, are gradually taken away from our our understanding and our knowledge because uh, 
you can think something and name it, but also you can make stuff happening without most of the people understanding how, how it works. Um, and um, maybe, um, um, yeah, last but not, not least, another thing I'm really interested in is this idea of the body and how when we try to imagine what a hacker is or does uh, is uh, we never think about the social movement or um, a person trying to do something it's always looked at through the lens of um, data and money or something quantifiable, or at least that's the way I think about this, and maybe also the way it's wrongly portrayed in uh, um, in media. And um, going back to what you were mentioning about uh, Lara Favaretto, the artist uh, that uh, invited us and whose project these clandestine talks are, she sent us um, um, a series of images to kind of inspire us or for us to consider, and they were very loose and maybe not necessarily linkable to mm, this idea of hacker, but there was one that to me was kind of interesting, and it was this man whose face you couldn't see and had uh, like a jacket oh, over mm -hmm. his head as if uh, he didn't have a, a head and uh, yeah, headless for some reason, and yeah, I'm just going to put it out there. Sounds like the idea of a hacker in, uh, say, in the main mainstream media. I know, mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that guy with the hoodie. That's the hoodie. Uh, yeah, Mr. That Robot. Is the one <laughs> that is the one doing the bad thing all over the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting figure, for sure. I mean, while we think this is the hacker, it gives a lot of space for the entities that are really doing a big arm on the internet to be unchecked. I mean, it's easier, exactly. you know, to give a uh, scapegoat, uh, easily yeah. identified, uh, more or less young, uh, more or less, uh, you know, marginal. And that's the person that is the threat of the internet. That's, uh, that's uh, on, 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 say, on, on, uh, on uh, uh, almost um, maybe a meta level, that's the whole problem of unauthorized knowledge. The holder of an unauthorized knowledge is going to be the same scapegoat because the holder of the unauthorized knowledge is not doing what the ones with the authorized knowledge are doing and that is where the harm is and you are completely right to say that uh, the ones uh, uh, doing the most harm to the internet uh, or to society in to general, the population. Exactly. to society in general, is uh, is. Uh, I mean, it's 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 very necessary to take a lot of our conversation out of IT, out of the technology, to project it to society mm. in in uh, to society in general. And one of the main mover of that is, of course, but naming it is exact is immediately killing the conversation. Almost is to to speak out the C word for capitalism. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The because the, yeah, no, no, it's very true. So ju just to react on something that you were just saying, the uh, why, I mean, on a personal level, I've been interested to um, to join and lead the Cyber Peace Institute. It was because of Cyber Peace. It's not, it was not Cyber Security Institute, you know, it's not about securing the computers and the network, etc. That's okay, it's important, but that's not, that's, yeah, it's not what I would strive for. What's interesting here is to say, this internet, this cyberspace, what I want to call it, this kind of mental construct, because it doesn't really exist, in fact, uh, it's, uh, it's just a mean to an end. And the end is the safety, the security, the dignity, the equity of human beings, you know, in, in, in whatever they do. And what they do can be very critical. I mean, without a, a secure cyberspace today, you don't have access to water. You don't have access to food. You don't have access to healthcare. Yeah. You can't discuss. You can't get knowledge. And... Uh, and you were saying it depends on the on the region of the world where you are in the countries. This has a specific meaning if you're in the Western world, because everything is digitized and you click and something happens like the magic, you know, of, uh, of uh, three centuries ago. But if you're other part of the world and you want to access this, it's not via the internet that you're going to access it. Yeah, exactly. You're going to access it via capitalist services exactly. that are going to pretend to be the internet. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and that's problematic. Yeah, yeah it, it, it is very, it is very, one of the most shocking things, and 
I ad I admit that I did not realize that because it's and and then I was in development studies. Can you imagine? But say uh, you're absolutely right in saying that we have to. But you said that we have to look at uh, at at other parts of the world. When I read that the, f the failure of Facebook, which was a few days ago, if I'm not not mistaken, put us users of Facebook. I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, into inconvenience. But it was a lifeline via WhatsApp. It was a lifeline for people. Ah, you mean when uh, it stopped? Yeah. Just yeah. Or well. and, and, and that was absolutely shocking on two, to me, on two, on two planes. It's yeah, it's, 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 it's a scandal that uh, 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 a failure of Facebook put people into real life difficulties. But it's also a scandal that it has come to that. Why is it that people have become so dependent on proprietary uh, 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 technologies, which are not made for their interest in mind, but only to make money of it out of it? By the way, I never understood how you can make money <laughs> by giving free services to people who have no cash anyway. But that's another. That's another. It's completely another point. That's my my own naivety and uh, unknowledge. But uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, prop. Uh, uh, we have used the term proprietary knowledge. Is bad in itself. At that at that l at that level, that's 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 one of the things we should combat. But yeah, what what one of my problems? You are you are in a, uh, uh, Stefan is in a better position than than I am because at least he has a focus. He has a focused an institution with focusing on something quite precise, even if it's very wide. But if you are like me, an observer of uh, of what's going on in general, you have looking at files all over the place. And then I'm not even talking about the general cluster fuck <laughs> our society is in. Clim climate? Uh, <laughs> anyone? It <laughs> <laughs> goes back to the big C also, mm -hmm. this, this one. <laughs> Would you like uh, Stefan to tell us a bit more about the S Cyber Peace Project? I really like this title, and I was also thinking um, uh, so much of you know how usually these conversations are framed are about binaries, mm -hmm. and maybe you know a good way of trying to move past this is uh, yeah en enlarging the terminology and from an, a very negative space bring it to something you know potentially positive and i was i was imagining uh, you know war and peace the novel you're you're the cyber piece <laughs> of that equation <laughs> maybe uh, yeah to tell us more about how how you got there and yeah my pleasure with the, well, something that you said before in fact was uh, interesting it w when i when i joined uh, it was before that was mm -hmm. in my year in, uh, in Europol. I, I was before in Europol, I uh, was program manager to uh, create and then uh, be chief of staff for the European Cybercrime Center. And then I created and led the unit that was anti Daesh and Al Qaeda propaganda online uh, in between uh, Charlie Hebdo and Bataclan when it was really like something. Yeah, it was quite tragic. And, uh, and despite the fact that all of this is happening and is impacting human beings. It's a fact, I guess everyone knows, or at least everyone has the you know the hint of it. I was thinking of your go of your search, you know, that you do in different parts of the world. If today you make a search and you take the big names of the big cyber attacks, so you take WannaCry, NotPetya, Kaseya, SolarWinds, first you need to know what they are. So it's already in a cluster of knowledge. So you need to be a bit informed to understand that this could you could be a victim of something you don't even know the name of. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's start with that. But imagine that you know. You put that in Google, in Bing, wherever, DuckDuckGo. What you're going to see, images are images of computer. You will see figures. You will see like numbers of cash that has been stored, etc. What you will not see ever is the face of someone. Yeah. As if this is computer fighting computers. Yeah. It's the network hitting the network. Mm -hmm. And this is so non-humanized as a problem. So how can we, how can we hope to, 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 to design human-centric solutions? Mm -hmm. And that's really what yeah, decided me to join the institute because it was a practical uh, vehicle to implement human-centric solution towards vulnerable communities. The one with the, what we do is we provide assistance uh, to the one with the least capacity to defend themselves against the one that have money, time, incentive, network to attack. 
So, and when the asymmetry is at the, the worst, that's where we enter into play. And for example, we specialized ourselves in uh, helping NGOs. So NGOs in the humanitarian sector, mm -hmm. where uh, their mission is sensitive, their field of action is sensitive, uh, their data is super sensitive, their beneficiaries is super sensitive, and their cyber security level is very, very low. And criminals know that, uh, state actors know that, but there was really no one really to defend them. So that's where we, you know, we want to, uh, to, to spend our resources and try to make a difference, but not only to have like transactional help, because it's nice to help people, I mean, it's what you need to do, but the whole idea is how the knowledge that you generate from that help, what are the cracks, what are the vulnerabilities, who are the real actors, who are the real threats, He's not that guy that everyone is looking for and with his hoodie in his, in his uh, basement. That's not this one. So it's uh, state actors, it's uh, the hybridation between criminal groups and state actors. These are the real threats. And how do we make sure that states, when they discuss about norms and law and regulation, when they pave the way of the future of you, me, or cyberspace, the one for the future generation, how do they understand where the real threat is? But not, you know, starting to put text, a treaty, on the basis of, oh, no, no, but we know who is the cyber criminal. He's the hacker, you know. He's the one that doesn't like the black box. Mm -hmm. He's the one that is not, uh, is not happy and okay and smiling when he's clicking, uh, you know, and scrolling down uh, with algorithm. He or she has no clue how they work. And I guess we can be a bit more ambitious for all yeah, of us. Yeah, and maybe it's interact. about also turning the lens and showing the effects or the people affected yeah. by this rather than yeah. the supposed uh, kind of culprit. Um, maybe also, m maybe this might help uh, in my mind is getting less abstract and maybe, I don't know, lead by examples. So I don't know if you want to share also, I don't know, r r real events or, um, and uh, sorry, I um, just wanted to add something because you were mentioning when there was a big freeze of the social media and, and I think, again, it's very layered conversation and I think you know, as people in the West uh, with a certain level of uh, education and access to things, we can decide to, you know, log off Facebook. But for most people, they use WhatsApp is, is a survival, yeah. is yeah. like is yeah. talking to their family back in Africa yeah. when they live and work in Europe or elsewhere. And it's a tool, so they I don't even question, you know, what's behind it. So, yeah. I I, by the way, I find that very problematic that uh, uh, we have landed in a situation like that. I would just like uh, to, to come back to what you said about when governments are enacting rules and etc. One of the biggest problems I think is that the very limited, sometimes non-existent knowledge of, uh, uh, of rule makers, of decision uh, takers, of how the technology works. The technology has come in fact, completely out of control. And one of my m main contention, and it has, it has uh, uh, at least uh, lateral uh, 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 connection to the people using WhatsApp in, uh, in uh, quote unquote developing countries. Uh, that is that uh, uh, technology has escaped even I think in some instances the, uh, uh, the control of the people uh, developing it and uh, using it. It's a bit, I see a bit of a parallel with the financial crisis. When the financial crisis uh, happened in uh, 2008, uh, diagnostics were, some uh, were about um, how could it come and so and then one discovered that a lot of things, a lot of financial instruments were not even understood, vehicles were not even understood by the people who were acting on them. It was, uh, it, 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 it was a kind of, of rush forward. And, and, and uh, IT, uh, uh, information technology, in my, uh, in, in my view, has gone, has gone the same way. So there's also, uh, there's also a big problem there. So empowering people is probably not enough in uh, empowering for the situation we have now. We might also be thinking about reversing uh, the situation in the sense that uh, the technology as it exists now has become a bit too has be become really a bit too complicated you cannot simplify technology to the uh, to the utmost limit one one of the example i have is that uh, my friend and now disappeared Ariane Kamphuis 
who was an expert in internet in security and in encryption and was really propagating the use of encryption by vulnerable uh, people in his case more in the west so it were journalists mm -hmm. uh, adv uh, uh, advocate human rights advocates and people like that but propagating this encryption uh, 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 for everyone there was one big problem is that you cannot simplify encryption uh, endlessly but the average user will not understand it up to the even the minimum level that you have to understand True. it so you have a gap between the absolute minimum you can reach in complexity understandable complexity of encryption and the maximum average knowledge of the majority of the user and that that gap for the time being is n is unbridgeable True. and that is something that you will see in in many in many instances and uh, uh, but the gap is getting larger if that I cannot say that okay. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> I, that I'm, I'm I, I found I found the image I found the image good enough to without uh, without the need to quantify it it's of course very important to know whether the gap is widening or or uh, diminishing because mm. especially if it diminishes then you can hope that you reach uh, a point that uh, 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 um, security for everybody. The end of vulnerability, of uh, the end of the uh, uh, problems that have vulnerable peoples and communities, which you are addressing, which Stefan is addressing, uh, uh, can be closed. If it is, uh, if it is uh, 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 augmenting, which might very well be the case. Well, yes. Uh, yeah, again, it, it depends yeah. from which perspective but you're looking at this, uh, from uh, yeah, the, the big C corporations or the, the people uh, or certain group. Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what you were saying before in terms of the lack of digital literacy in the policy maker sphere, it's very true. It's very, very true. Uh, I mean, in my years in Europol or now in the work with the Cyber Peace Institute, uh, I spent and we spend a lot of time providing knowledge to policymakers. Uh, not s and it's not about position or it's it's about the basic knowledge, you know, the the, the, the keys that you need to have to understand the technology, the, the topic that you you've been presented, yeah, yeah. and that's quite tough. Yeah. Uh, also, because this, the especially in policymaking. The knowledge is not existing in a vacuum; it's existing in a context of an organization. Yes. Uh, the way governments are organized uh, is is um, is putting a frame on what they are supposed to understand, what they are not supposed to understand. The topic they are supposed to look into and are not supposed to look exactly. into. There are silos yeah. that are existing there for decades, yeah. Yeah. and you will never. Very recent example. You wanted example. So you have discussion at United Nations on cyber security. So you have groups, United Nations groups, two of them already. So it's interesting, open-ended working group and uh, group of experts. Okay, let's let's go beyond the acronyms. United Nations discussion to discuss about norms and regulation in the cyberspace for responsible behavior. You park that. Then you have another uh, initiative with the UN Cybercrime Treaty, where there this is about the future of how to understand cybercrime and how to fight cybercrime. This is not the same group. Mm. And <laughs> when you discuss with Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I'm doing this a lot, telling to them at the end of the day, you know, behind, this is the same internet, mm -hmm. this is the same cables. Mm -hmm. What you need to learn mm -hmm. is more important is the difference between the lower level of the internet, when you're really close to the cable, almost at electrical level, and when you're in the content that is passing by the pipelines. Because then suddenly it's a different topics that you organize yourself al uh, alongside this would make sense. But that by default, you consider that uh, this is me, this is me, and uh, you know we never, we never work together and that's the way it is. And because you organize like this, you frame the topic and you and you absolutely blind to the reality of the technology, what it says, mm -hmm. then, then there's an issue. The second, the second gap, uh, you were asking another example, is uh, this, this reflex specific government that someone needs to be responsible point me to the responsible community. Is that the industry? Mm. Is this the criminals? Mm. Is this another state? You know, who should I, should I investigate? And let's take the example of deepfakes. So I was still in Europol at the time, uh, end of 2017, when deepfakes become a bit mainstream. How, how it became mainstream? It's not that there was a company behind. There was no state behind. What happened is that suddenly, 
there was the, 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 the free thing that you need to create big the deep fakes. Uh, TensorFlow, so artificial in the machine learning algorithm was for free, open source on the internet. The availability of personal data with faces on the internet was enormous. You could download half of Facebook, Instagram, whatever you wanted to do. And the processing power that you need to train your algorithm yeah. was super cheap yeah. for the first time. And then all of this was put together by a community of people that did not even know each other. Mm -hmm. And in three weeks, they create deepfakes, mm -hmm. technology. And this is one of the biggest threats that you have to democracy these days. If you cannot trust, and something that you said before in terms of, uh, you know, what, what this construct in between all people with the internet is on the basis of trust. If people cannot understand every day the encryption, mm -hmm. at least they need to trust that yep, someone exactly. understands yep. and they can trust that someone to yep. safeguard their interests. Yep. And if suddenly you cannot trust, you know, what is presented to you via a screen, via whatever, that's problematic. And there was no responsibility behind it. It's because you, you were mentioning it before, Patrice, the, the technology is moving so fast, and more importantly, the convergence of different technology is hitting and booming in a way that no one can really predict what is going to happen next. Mm -hmm. And for policymaker, this is a, that's siderating. They are like mm -hmm. frozen. What I'm going to do, you tell me that uh, what I learned is useless to what is going to happen mm -hmm. because it's exponential rise of technology. No one can plan exponentially. Uh, I know what happened the last five years. I can plan five years ahead normally. Now the world no. doesn't work like this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's complicated. And the, and, the and, the and the politicians, you said they were freeze. They froze. Uh, they have, uh, how do you say in, in English, démissionné? <laughs> quit. Uh, they've Fight. quit, yeah. they've <laughs> quit long time ago. One of the interesting things about the internet, especially if you come from the French, from French culture, uh, French history, uh, uh, is that uh, it's, the first it's the first technology which has been completely left to the uh, private parties. It was developed at some stage, of course, it was developed by the state, but by the moment was developed in the United States, was developed in France also, in, in many in, in other countries. But when it became really large scale, and I could observe that in the Netherlands, the government declined, uh, 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 quit. Yeah. That happened in the early 90s, when we were doing in Amsterdam the digital city. Uh, uh, we said, well, this is going to grow. This, uh, we would need more government, uh, we would need more government uh, intervention and, uh, and, and financing, of course. And the answer of the government was, no, we are going to give it all to the private parties. Let, let the market, which and is the shorthand <laughs> for corporations, mm. let <laughs> the market uh, lead the way. And from there on, well, uh, the rest is history in a certain sense. Yeah. And that was that's why I say this, uh, this quitting of the government, and you can spend a lot of time to explain to politicians and decision makers how it works and so. I'm afraid it's, it's deliberate, probably at an unconscious level. But as you say, yeah, it's too complicated. We quit. And there's something, ag again, we step now out of technology and go into general politics. That's, uh, that's, a, ca that's, uh, uh, mm, uh, that's a characteristic of the modern state. The modern state does not care anymore. It does not want to handle these things. I'm one of my many asides is that I'm a public transport uh, interest. We don't, w it's far too complicated. We don't want to. Let let the market uh, do it, and I mean, uh, nobody forces you to go into the tram. Of course, you have in Luxembourg, you have a fantastic uh, uh, free system, <laughs> but uh, 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 in general, it's a kind of it's a kind of yeah. When it in the olden days, we were responsible for it. When it went w well, we never got any uh, compliment. When it worked bad, questions in parliaments, questions in parliaments. Now it's easy. It's trains are not working. Well. Uh, company is responsible and mm. as you said let's let's look where are the resp let's search for the responsible and let's make sure it's not us and it's not, and it's not impossible just to to to, to complement on this uh, sometimes policymakers they can be ambitious sometimes they don't know that they're ambitious to be honest look <laughs> at <G> <laughs> look at gdpr this is this is a fact that at the very beginning of gdpr the eu did not realize what it was going to do globally mm -hmm. And uh, let me just explain GDPR. So <laughs> GDPR is the <laughs> is the um, uh, global data protection, uh, the general data protection regulation, uh, which is uh, created from the EU, but in fact now pushes anyone processing personal data on the internet to set up some basic rules in order to protect uh, the uh, yeah, the owner of this personal data. I mean, it's kind of a shortcut, but that's something like this. 
And because of something coming from the EU, all the companies in the world had to change their processes, their business model, their notification. Okay, there's another debate to say, is this in the end effective or not? This we can, this we can discuss. But it really, it really changed the way companies had to do business. And on the basis of something that was purely ethical, it was about ethics. People mm. need to be in capacity to control their personal data. Mm. And uh, now the EU is doing the Digital Service Act, which I think is going to have a similar effect because it's on the content level. So it's something about uh, no content moderation, uh, what can be on the platform, what cannot be, right of recourse, uh, takedown of content. It's uh, and again, I mean, this content is not living somewhere; it's just passing by all over the cables of the internet. So yeah, I mean, I I'm not no don't want to justify anyone, but I just also think there are different speeds to these things, and technology is moving at a much faster pace than you know politic protocols or democracy can keep up with, and also this idea of trust. I I think that has been really exploited by you know big corporations and made a lot of money like harvesting all of our data until someone told them hey wait a, wait a minute you know really telling us trust us we know what we, we are doing and no one maybe not even understanding really what was going on i mean the uh, great majority of people then of and course. by the and by the way that's someone saying hey what's going on that you're mentioning is a hacker that's yeah. exactly what hacking is about. Yeah. Yeah. To me, Cambridge Analytica, it's yeah. uh, investigative journalism, yeah. but uh, hacker uh, is in some sort an yeah. investigative journalist of the internet. Yeah. You know, he's asking the question, yeah. putting the fingers, and yeah. saying, okay, what's happening here? Yeah. Yeah. With, yeah. Uh, with, uh, with various uh, consequences and a various degree of success. And, uh, and unfortunately, the balance uh, is... There are some good, uh, there are some good uh, developments, but um, I'm myself, I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic because there have been, in recent years, there have been major disclosures, mm -hmm. which were of the caliber that you would say, well, now things are going to change. But it's, uh, it's, uh, oh, there's a parallel with, uh, with uh, the COVID situation, which put a complete break on the economy. And suddenly people realized, well, we, we now have clean air. And now a piece, piece of pace of life uh, has slowed down. Maybe we should really change. Well, at the moment, we are a few percent uh, 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 still lower than uh, 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 the emissions we did in 2019. So we are, we are back to, to normal, quote unquote. And uh, with these disclosures, the l last big one, it was not even the last, there is uh, one that had just come now, but I can't, I can't uh, uh, recall it exactly. But say the last for me, the really major break, uh, the major uh, uh, disclosure was Snowden. And that's when Snowden happened, I had really kind of uh, uh, idea, okay, we have always thought it was like that, but now we know. Mm -hmm. And there's a really a difference between thinking uh, uh, where you are, you are pretty sure what's, what's called in Dutch uh, 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 um, um, probability, which is very, very, very close to uh, uh, surety, to, to, to be absolutely sure of it. And, uh, but now you are absolutely sure. It's out and things will change. No, nothing changed. And uh, it's, uh, it's, even, it's e even going, uh, getting worse. So my question would be, maybe it's kind of turn, uh, uh, allow it or not allow it, uh, uh, turn of the discussion. But is it maybe not time to put a break on technology? Ooh. Or do we have to accept that, yeah, things are like they are. It's, uh, I mean, we, we have to live with it and uh, we, have to we have to live with Facebook till it, uh, it dies itself. <laughs> <laughs> or it gets in the metaverse or, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or what? Transforms. Or is it, or, 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 or can we not, uh, uh, can we not uh, put a break to it? And, uh, and that is within the circles I am in. It's, uh, it's a measure of discussion and bone of contention. And uh, it's called degrowth. Mm -hmm. La décroissance in, uh, mm -hmm. in French. And, uh, and, uh, I, I am, as I was in its time, a fervent advocate of free and uh, open source software and or. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, no, I'm no an advocate for decroissance, but uh, for, for degrowth. Mm. And degrowth means also technological degrowth in the sense that 
you can empower people in using technology to a far larger extent than you can now and making it possible for them to use technology uh, uh, to use uh, IT but at a lower level than uh, the technology that we have as it is being uh, 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 deployed and exploited by big corporation and can be only by big corporation mm. so in uh, at some stage uh, I, I was very much into the discussion about free Wi-Fi and, uh, and free Wi-Fi that means community owned and community run Wi-Fi and there have been a lot of, uh, of uh, well, it started as experiments and it's, it's still ongoing. Uh, one is in Denmark, one is in Catalonia, and they work very well. People are connected, Wi-Fi is functioning, they have communication, but uh, there's a little problem. YouTube is not going to pass it, not enough bandwidth for it. What do you want? What do you want both as community, as people? Or what do you want as, uh, say, uh, at government uh, uh, level? level? And at government level, I'm very afraid that in some instance, they will, and it happens in the United States, they will actually forbid it. They will actually forbid non-commercial, uh, 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 meaning non-corporate, uh, application of technology. Hmm. I, wo I wonder if there's like an in, in between, a bit in this uh -huh. binary of degrowth and like the protocols that implement barriers or frontiers that try to regulate something that keeps molding and changing <laughs> i mean i don't i don't pretend that i have the uh, the answer there because it's a very very fair question it's a very complicated one uh what i do know is there's no way that uh, that regulation can technically regulate technology this, this I don't believe in. Yeah. We, 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 we saw that uh, because technology is evolving in a way that no one even is uh, in capacity to predict now because of convergence and exponential yeah. growth. So, mm -hmm. so thi this I don't believe in technical limitation. You know, like a, a, yeah. a boundary in which technology is going to thrive and it cannot go beyond this. That I don't believe. But I do believe that regulation regulators have uh, a responsibility of at least promoting values at, at minima it works mm -hmm. it doesn't work mm -hmm. history will tell yeah. but their role there is to protect the population on the values that are the cement of this democracy of this state so here i'm talking you know uh, democracies eu because this is re where really you have this beacon of uh, of a bit of knowledge and hope to be a bit ambitious you know on rules and the regulations in the cyberspace so this should be pushed way more and being way more ambitious and then there from there you can assess if this is working or not, but at least to reach that point. Because otherwise, we are going to continue to say, oh, you know what, it's impossible. At yeah. the same time, no one is really going to try to, to, to stop it. So it's just going to boom exponentially, and you are going to have companies becoming the internet. And we're mentioning Facebook several times, and in some part of the world, for them, internet is Facebook. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow, when the metaverse is going to be out there, the internet is going to be the metaverse. Oh, it will fail. No, but you, you, you mm -hmm. see what I mean. <laughs> yes, uh, same, same, same kind of logic, yeah, the same yeah. way when they wanted to, to send their own uh, currency and then suddenly... And uh, let's take the example of Libra. Yeah. So when, when yeah, Facebook wanted to put uh, Libra out there, it's an interesting one because they could secure partnership with quite big uh, financial companies. So they had like this, uh, you know, this backup of the industry. And then they, they hit a hiccup that they haven't seen coming because, you know, uh, Facebook, and, and uh, anything can go. Mm. Is that states woke up and say, wait, 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 wait. Isn't that the sole role of states to create money? <laughs> and uh, and that's really interesting because at the same time cryptocurrency were out yeah. except that with crypto there's no state behind yeah. there's no facebook yeah. behind there's no entity behind so you cannot really say you know uh, who is behind making bitcoin and ethereum it's the community so it's very difficult to regulate but then mm -hmm. suddenly there was a there was a face there was a name that was going to create money outside of state and then suddenly state yeah, works yeah. so it's not it's not absolutely impossible yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah i would say ambitious ambitious regulation and uh, reading the world today, it's uh, EU should lead. Sadly enough, it looks like EU is not in the strength to lead, and that's not, not, not great. Because yeah. otherwise, something that we discussed about in since the beginning, hacking. To for hacking to exist and to work, it's deeply linked to the existing infrastructure of the internet, yeah. how the internet works. Yeah. There's now 
there's now, as we speak, initiative from states to change the deeper nature of the Internet, mm -hmm. to transform this into a centralized system yep. controlled by states. And it's not a, a, a hypothesis that it could be like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people saying, nah, it's impossible, they will never change, you know, they want to do this technically, it's impossible. It is very possible. <laughs> and uh, if that happens, then this is the root of everything else. Then you change how people, you know, connect with each other. Yeah. Well, it's it's uh, it's it's funny because that uh, that stage that uh, uh, where the state uh, the states, according to you, and uh, I, I I I agree with you, um, was the stage in the very beginning of the internet and the ITU, the International yeah. uh, Telegraph or Telecommunication Union, wanted to keep control and failed to keep control, uh, failed to keep control. I think because of uh, of uh, passive or active Ameri U.S. government intervention who want to keep, keep the Internet American. Uh, uh, but the funny thing is that in, in those days, we, people who were for a free Internet, uh, were supporting, <laughs> objectively, we were supporting the U.S. government and ICANN in, in, yeah. in, in this. And, uh, and, 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 and now we are back to it. I think the, uh, 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 what, you, what you just described made me think, okay, that is plan A. Plan A is, as you say, the uh, 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 European Union kicking into action at doing something. Do we, have, do we have a plan B? We are living a plan B. That's mm. the problem. We are, we, are in, we are in plan B every day. Because no one has the ambition to do a plan A, plan A, B, plan whatever. There's no plan. Okay, so <laughs> let's, let's, let's call plan C. That <laughs> what is plan C? Yeah, it's true. Plan C would it's be that people take power, that the users would be also the producers. Uh, uh, in a cer well, I, I, I call them the producer, but uh, what I want to say is that the things are owned and run and, 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 and if possible, developed, by the way. Uh, yeah. No, not if possible, necessary have to be developed by the community, by, uh, by the people. Is there any chance to that? But which means that you need states to invest into digital literacy for their, for their population. Yeah. You need states to trust their people but and, to give them and to give them a lot of knowledge so that they can become really this uh, digital citizen, enlightened, yeah. understanding the technology and with the capacity yeah. to self-critically decide yeah. I'm using this yeah. app, I'm not using that one. In yeah. fact, I'm using no apps because I don't need apps yeah. and yeah. I can go back you know, to the structure of the internet. Yeah. But this yeah. is an effort of states providing a lot of knowledge yeah. for, for citizens to become something else than consumers. And that mm. will kill the business model of corporates. Yeah, because I think uh, these values that maybe you're talking about, uh, they are not shared. And I think when you talk about you know, the free internet and an open system, I think that was an idea that has been completely lost. And mm, if if um, internet was ever a public space, now is a completely private one. And I think also people engage as individuals, like community spaces are no longer there. So I think it, it really requires a whole new and, and, and it's system. So it's <laughs> and it's also nuance, I guess, because you, you, you cannot hope that state is going to be responsible, you know, for the whole stack, down the, uh, uh, up to the application, down to the technologies. Yeah. I mean, the private sector will always have a role, uh, a role there. Uh, just a question of, you know, if... I, I Okay, I'm not talking about the degrowth option. I'm talking about the... Uh, there's a regulation. There's a clear empowerment of people, you know, to understand what they do and, uh, and, and understand the ecosystem, be, be becoming empowered. But there's still, I guess, an industry behind that is providing, you know, some sort of tools or others because not everyone will be in capacity or having the time or the appetite to develop their own tools to be, you know, within the open source. I mean, we, we saw that. But these companies can really well, uh, and they show that they could be the tools with GDPR, I'll go back to GDPR, could really well, you know, uh, operate mm in a framework that will be you know properly yeah regulated yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 now yeah. the problem is that this, this this is not this is not there yeah it's, it's, uh, it's self-regulation there's so much call for self-regulation uh, i mean we saw what self-regulation was doing in the financial crisis yeah, it's what it's you're nothing. mentioning well that has that has a lot to do because the kind of companies and i, I completely agree with you the kind of companies who could do that will by by definition not be big monopolistic companies they will be small community local uh, 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 company federating, so sharing the knowledge, not that uh, everyone developed the wheel 
or reinvent the wheel say in 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 uh, in, in search but uh, 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 what what you were using the word private huh? mm. maybe it's uh, it's it's private is is has a good connotation and uh, and refers to individuals it's it's maybe uh, uh, i think it's a kind of discussion it's better to always use the word corporate corporate versus this it's not public versus private it's public versus corporate mm -hmm. uh, 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 and yeah that uh, uh, the kind of regulation you are proposing is so much against the interest of corporates that also given the osmosis often between government and at the, at the personal level between government and corporates, I'm not very hopeful about that. So no, no, I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. No, no, for sure, for sure. At so the same how, how can we make it happen? Yeah, not I'm not uh, I'm not <laughs> demanding a next one. No, 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 no. I, no, no, I get I get that. The um, <laughs> we go back to trust. It's it's uh, first we go back to staying ambitious. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a report yesterday in Switzerland uh, from the uh, National um, Center for Cybercrime um, for Cybercrime about the fact that uh, crime is on the rise, cybercrime, etc. Everything is bad. So and yeah, factually speaking, it's it's worse than it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's exactly the time not to be, you know, oh, okay, nothing works. What are we going to do? In in the contrary, and I was thinking about the situation. To be honest, all the tools are there. That's that's yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, worst. That's, that's the worst. Yeah, the tools the are worst. there. Yeah. 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 It's just that they are not they are not used because again, and I'm pushing a lot of responsibility on states. Uh, corporation have a lot of responsibility too, but in this case, it's states. I mean, states are there, you know, to to lead the way. And to say that all the tools that we have, at least let's use them, you know, to the bone. Yep. And then if they don't work, then we see if we send in something else. Uh, you were mentioning, you know, this uh, speed of technology, etc. We're saying that uh, criminality and abuse are evolving at the speed of light. And we are not even replying at the speed of law. <laughs> we, ha we have laws. We don't, we're not even there. I mean mm -hmm. what but then you, uh, uh, if you say that, but uh, <laughs> I hope I'm not sliding down into the conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> but we say that when you say that, the impression uh, against ground that it's somewhere, it's deliberate. And that deliberate is not, I will always say, it's not at the conscious level. But it's, it's at the unconscious level, it's somewhere in the DNA of political power. We, <laughs> we were discussing power coming in and out, that's uh, interesting, maybe we have to come back to that. Before coming back to that, I would talk about trust, because trust is indeed so essential, but in what kind of, uh, of uh, uh, at the moment, in what kind of system are we living? We are living, in fact, in a trustless system. And why? Because uh, uh, the impression has gained ground that trust, which is a basically human thing, it's maybe an essential, it's, uh, no, it's maybe not, it's, it is an essential human characteristic. Trust cannot be trusted. And we have uh, walked into a si situation of trustlessness, which is the world of machines. And that has a very long history. And that history is, uh, is has been uh, uh, one of the author, to me, who has explained that, is Manuel de Landa, in a book which is called War in the Age of Intelligent Machines. In that book, Manuel de Landa explains that very early on in the United States, in the, say, structuration of the United States uh, in the years after the War of Independence, so we are talking first half of the 19th century, the idea gained ground that when you had the chain of decisions, of, of processes, the weakest element in the chain was the human. And that had to be taken out of the chain and replaced by protocols, by rules. And nowadays, these protocols and rules are enforced by machines. And then you get a whole uh, uh, situation that the trust is, uh, uh, is taken out, and it's a basic philosophy of cryptocurrency, is to take the human out and replace it by algorithm, what I would call, al or what I not, but many people will call, algorithmic trust called 
uh, you don't need to trust humans because the protocols enforced by the machines will do the work. Once you are in that, you are out of political decision making. So if you have a system like ours now, where a lot of things, look around, around you, it's not only technological, a lot of things is based on pre-established rules and post-happening certification. Uh, uh, yeah, to me, to me, you are lost. And I've seen this in so many times. I mean, I was academic, but I was a kind of maverick academic because I'd never, I never uh, uh, went into uh, uh, yeah all kind of things. Which wha one of the things of an academic uh, uh, establishing the credential of an academic is a s is a, s a CV. I never had a proper CV. I don't have a bio. I don't have a, 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 a what I wrote. I don't know what I wrote. But this is completely. That, uh, so it doesn't I it doesn't any longer work like that. It did work in the time that you had human trust, because people know knew knew you, and, uh, and and that was sufficient. I remember in in. I'm sorry if I'm I'm talking in all kinds. I see you frowning. No no no. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with yeah, you. I'm, I'm, with I'm you. there too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, in the olden days, to obtain a passport in the in the United Kingdom in Great Britain. The only thing you had to do is to provide a, 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 a photograph and have that photograph signed by your local member of parliament. You went to your local member of parliament, speak, uh, 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 what do you call the uh, surgery, uh, uh, appointment time, uh, what, what's called the uh, spreekuur. Uh, anyway, uh, and oh yeah, oh yeah, you're Mr. Smith, yeah, yeah, fine, oh yeah, okay, okay, sign you, sign you, went sent to the passport office, you got your passport and why? Because it was trust, and it worked. That's a s that's a fantastic thing. Of uh, I had another example, which is really I think this is uh, uh, this is a, a very good example of how human trust and um, uh, uh, honesty works. Ethics is that in uh, in the High Court of Scotland, um, all judges had to have a pigeonhole where the lawyers of the conflicting parties put their uh, brief, what they are their arguments, what they are going to say to the judge. So you have in the same pigeonhole, reachable from outside, mm -hmm. you have the argument of party A and party B. Now you immediately understand that party B would really much like to know what party A is going <laughs> to say. Well, lawyers of both parties, they would not even think of taking it out and looking at it. And that is a form of trust that has, that has disappeared nowadays. But and I, I guess also because you take the human out of because it. You take uh, the human so out I don't think yeah. you can apply the word trust to algorithms. I think people, it's a cop out. People don't trust algorithms. They just let them do their thing exactly. and never question. Yeah. So yeah. I think philosophically, we have to go back to this idea of ethics and responsibility that you can only apply to people or people yeah. that take on that, yeah. in my mind. Mm, yeah. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, no, I do. The, uh, just reflecting on what you're saying, the I if you put trust and algorithm in the same conversation oh. and how it relates to hacking and understanding the system, I go back to hacking for understanding the system, yeah. how it works, yeah. 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 For, 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 for the sake of uh, improvement or the common good. Um, if we consider that algorithm replace law, yeah, because when you code some rules, that becomes you know the that gives you an environment you can only and uh, operate in these rules, and these rules are managed by an algorithm. De facto, this algorithm is the law. Yeah, code is law. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a famous book by yeah. Lawrence. Uh, yeah. uh, Lawrence, not Lang, but the other. <laughs> I don't remember. I the I man from uh, yeah. from uh, um, uh, 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 copy copyright Commons, uh, CCC, CC. Okay, I don't remember. <laughs> 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 but uh, I mean, that's that's the idea. So, so suddenly it becomes it becomes the law. If if you don't have hacking activities to uh, scrutinize this algorithm, to understand how it works, to look into the core of the algorithm, and there's no bias because mm -hmm. algorithm at the end of the day is not coded by machines. 
even if that one was coded by a machine, before that one, it had been coded by a human at yeah. some point. Mm -hmm. And on the basis of a decision making that was, you know, human related. So it's not that you because you put human out of the loop, that human was really out of the loop. There was <laughs> there was something somewhere. And uh, and we saw this scandal, you know, with face recognition not so long ago in terms of uh, the, the facial recognition algorithm was not uh, in capacity to recognize. Uh, it was more in capacity to recognize a white male rather than uh, than a white female. And it was between white female and black female that it was absolutely no down. Yeah. Why? Because the bias, because of the data so sources. Yeah. So hacking, again, uh, looking in the code, understanding how it works, why it, why, why it works, uh, an anecdote, uh, a... Um, Students, I don't remember where, they were so learning machine lear learning machine learning, so training machine learning algorithm, and what they were doing, they were trying to have uh, a uh, a algorithm which would automatically detect a um, banana. So when they would banana. put a banana in the frame, it would detect the banana. So okay, people, you know, are not very <laughs> they are bold. I don't know what can I, what can I tell you? And it was very funny. So they were they were taking you know they had a video, they were putting the banana, and then it was as fast as possible. They would detect it and giving them a light or whatever. And then became super, super fast. And then they tried to look into the black box of the machine learning to see, you know, what works. And they saw a neuron, like in the middle of the black box, that was super active and looked like it was very effective. And why? Because it became a face recognition algorithm, a face detection algorithm. Because the machine learning program quickly understood that when the face was coming in, the banana was coming <laughs> just <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so it became very good in detecting that face. Yeah. And it was, but, but if you don't know how it's coded, you really think it's working on the banana, banana. No, it's working on the face. <laughs> So yeah, hacking. <laughs> so the noises you might be hearing is us Ooh. having some chocolates. <laughs> 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 and we are here in a bunker and uh, I'm sitting across uh, from uh, Patrice that is wearing an amazing uh, uh, purple t-shirt uh, that says Vatican hacked embassy. And maybe you want to tell us something about that. But the people cannot see the t-shirt and the t-shirt <laughs> is very, <laughs> <laughs> there are not many of them, but uh, very quickly it's, uh, it's, a s it's a story about uh, big hacker events where I used to go, well in even earlier I used to co-organize them and uh, have become so big that people organize in villages and, uh, of uh, 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 mind uh, alike people all coming from a certain certain countries and then it's called an embassy uh, and a friend of mine was a long time part of the Italian embassy but he got kicked out of the Italian embassy so he started his own which was the Vatican embassy but Vatican embassy that's a bit bizarre so he put it hacked <laughs> Vatican hacked embassy <laughs> and he still uh, he still went to these uh, big uh, chaos computer club German hackers mm -hmm. uh, uh, organization event with uh, this t-shirt and bringing along bringing along uh, better grappa <laughs> than uh, his italian ex-friends who had kicked him out mm -hmm. that's the story of the t-shirt to mm. j just uh, give you maybe a funny interlude i um, i remembered a book by an art critic from the u.s called uh, um, david hickey that it's titled Pirates and Farmers, uh, and I remember one of uh, Lara's word mention was, was pirate, again, I guess, in relationship to this weird idea of hacker. So David Hickey writes, um, I'm going to explain this to you very simply. All human creatures are divided into two groups. There are pirates and there are farmers. Farmers build fences and control territory. Pirates tear down fences and cross borders. There are good pirates and bad pirates, good farmers and bad farmers, but there are only pirates and farmers. There are very different <laughs> kinds of creatures, and some pirates even recognize the importance of farmers. My late friend Roger Miller, a famous pirate, wrote this in a song after a visit with his tax attorney. Squares make the word go round, he wrote. Sounds profane, sounds profound. But government things can't be made to by hipster wearing rope-soled shoes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice one. Barrett's are, are it's interesting that he makes, uh, the he makes the distinction between pirates and, uh, and uh, farmers. farmers. Because a classical anthropological distinction is between nomads and farmers. And the problem is exactly the same in the sense that n pirates are nomads of the sea. 
and um, now we really move out of IT, but back <laughs> into capitalism in a certain <laughs> sense. David Graeber, who uh, 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 has an uh, anth anarchist anthropologist, is very famous for his book 5,000 Years of Debt, which is really a fundamental Kay. book, um, wrote, it's not very well known, also about pirates. And uh, 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 pirates are seen as in, in a certain sense, li uh, like hackers, as uh, 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 representative of democracy, horizontalism, uh, sharing, uh, 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 knowledge seeking. And uh, uh, he's not the only one writing in that sense about pirates, because like many things in history, uh, there are some accepted opinion about other period of times. A nice one is the Dark Ages. And uh, as group, nice one is pirates, uh, or yeah, there are also Templars, and well, quite a lot, which the mainstream has attributed generally a bad opinion to. But there is contrarian opinion, often backed by, if not facts, at least good evidence, that you can be seen differently. And then you get, <laughs> you get a conflict between people holding for the specialist, uh, uh, holding for the old opinion and, and uh, uh, others holding for the new opinion. And Graeber, whose last book, not his last published book, uh, his last unpublished book, that means not published in English language, <laughs> but <laughs> translated and published in Italian and in French, uh, is about uh, Libertalia, the story of uh, of um, uh, pirates in the on the uh, uh, coast of Madagascar, the west coast, the east coast, no, the east, uh, yeah, the east coast of Madagascar, at the very end of the 17th, very beginning of the 18th century, having escaped the Caribbean because the Caribbean had become really pacified by. Uh, uh, mainstream powers <laughs> and uh, 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 restarting their allegedly very democratic, very uh, horizontal, very sharing communities in, uh, in, uh, on the coast of Madagascar, being attacked by uh, uh, other specialists on pirates as projecting ideas of the 21st century mm. into the history whether everyone kno knows, or at least they knew, that pirates are really bad and their, s and their societies were uh, extremely cruel and extremely in unequal and extremely uh, 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 aggressive o also among themselves. And uh, this utopianism was absolutely <laughs> out of bound. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the same kind of stories you have about, uh, about pirates or uh, about uh, nomads and farmers or in the United States about uh, Indians, cowboy and Indians. What's the mainstream idea of Indians? Well, uh, it's, it's not very good. <laughs> They're very cruel, uh, a very cruel culture. What is the revisionist story about Indians? It's that they are very uh, good and we're very close to nature and actually are pointing to our future. And, s and so you have so many examples. And, uh, and, uh, and well, you have about the hacker story, you have exactly the same. <laughs> Yeah. Do you have any pirate stories for us? Ah, it uh, reminded me the um, the fact that um, I mean when at least I remember this for the for my uh, courses of history about uh, French history when you know the king uh, when there was still a king in France uh, was using uh, corsair so yeah. pirates in f specific format of pirates which were uh, allowed by the king to go out and uh, ransom, rampage, uh, see, uh, steal, you name it. But it was covered because, you know, ordered. But at the same time, you know, on their free days, they could also do some uh, pirating for their own intent <laughs> and their own... <laughs> <laughs> and the same is happening now. I mean, you have criminal groups that are uh, working very close to state interest. Yep. Or if they don't work close to state interest, at least yep. state let them uh, consciously yep. operate. So it doesn't mean that they are complice, but at least yep. they are clearly a, uh, I close my eyes into what you're doing as long as you don't attack me or my interest. Exactly. And uh, it's a situation that reminds me, you know, what we could see in this, uh, in this old age and uh, the word pirate uh, yep. yeah, yep. Ring, uh, rang that bell. 
Yeah, it's that, um, I think I, 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 I think it's a very good comparison, and then we get into uh, states deliberately engaging into um, uh, activities which endanger the well, it endanger the, the internet. It endanger the uh, people become very vulnerable. And, uh, and, uh, and indeed, these people uh, having sidelines in, uh, I would say, I would think mostly in the ransomware uh, uh, department. Yeah, there's and ransomware, there's other, there's other department. I mean, that, but something you just said, uh, and uh, just to be clear, I mean, it's not the only place where I would voice it, but I think it's a critical point is that the insecurity on the internet yeah. is the responsibility of states. And not only of states because of regulation, etc. I'm talking about attacks. I'm talking about being behind attacks or letting attacks go, the responsibility of states. is still not that guy in the hoodie uh, in his garage or in her garage. No, that's not, that's not, that's not the culprit. It's states. When you see attacks on the scale of uh, solar winds or you see attack on the scale of... Uh, you see this, this market of surveillance that is not only allowed by states, but it's purchased by states. You have companies like NSO putting this malware like Pegasus where you can transform the phone of anyone in zero click into a portable spy. Yeah. This exists because these companies are not hiding. Yeah. They're not, you know, in the dark net somewhere. Yeah. No, 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 no. They have a building uh, in the city. Everyone knows them. They, they spend millions in research and development and each and every dollar, euro, penny that is sent there is against the internet because it's to find holes in the internet and to exploit them against yeah. our common interest. And these companies exist yeah. because states let them exist first. Yeah. Second, buy them products. Yeah. And yeah. third, do not regulate how these products are exported in between states. Yeah. So this is the highest level responsibility. Then we can talk about this script kiddy that is, you know, <laughs> uh, playing with the network of the library uh, next door. Okay, yeah, we can yeah, talk yeah. about this, okay, but let's, let's have a bit of, you know, a... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, in Italy, you had hacking team. Yeah, you have a few more, but yeah. uh, 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 it's. Um, I was thinking about something which, as usual or as happens, I I got uh, I got lost into. And um, yeah, I mean to reply to the hacking team. That's uh, because we started with that word. It's good to yeah. go back to it every time. Hacking team was an abuse of the word. Yeah. I mean, the hacking thing has nothing to do with hacking. No. So, I mean, it's not because you claim the word that it means that this is the activity that you're doing. They were just taking money to exploit vulnerability on the internet and to empower mass surveillance that, yeah. in a lot of cases, was going against human rights. That's yeah. Yeah. With the, uh, with the uh, uh, states where their principal clients, um, the state should have, in this case, the Italian state should have regulated them mm -hmm. in selling, and that's what they pretend, and all these companies are pretending no, we sell only to legitimate uh, to legitimate parties, democratic states, for uh, purposes of combating criminality, uh, uh, and yeah, and then in the end, it turns out that they sell to uh, they sell to dictatorial regimes, going after uh, 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 human rights activists. Yeah. And and, and who knows what the state is going to become tomorrow? I mean, you sell to a state today and you think that this state is democratic and then suddenly something happens and then, you but know, it it's not exactly it the same state. in our own, I'm, our own it's I'm, I'm very glad that you are saying this because it reminds me something that's again pre-technology or pre-IT as we know it. It was a time of, uh, of Tony Blair, who was Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain, of the United Kingdom, who First Tony Blair and then his successor uh, 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 Brown, which is Gordon, Gordon <laughs> Brown, uh, implemented extremely liberty-threatening laws. W w they were attacked on that. Oppo there was opposition with saying, but these are liberty-threatening laws. Ah, yeah, but we will only make good use of them. <laughs> It will only it will be only in the defense of democracy and the legitimate uh, uh, rule of law order. But when someone said that uh, yes, but you never know what what can happen. Even Great Britain can become a dictatorship. Actually, there is a very good television uh, uh, program of the BBC, which ran uh, twenty years ago or more, uh, and then was uh, was uh, shelved. 
because too too dangerous, too 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 uh, too bad to to think about it. Where you saw an extremely uh, extremely credible scenario of uh, of uh, 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 a government being elected into power, which was really not in the interest of. Uh, well what was this program you're mentioning yeah well i'm 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 trying i'm trying um, I, I can better describe it it was the idea was a, a labor like popular uh, uh, popular uh, politician became elected prime minister well uh, uh, he he got uh, election gave him sufficient majority in parliament to to govern and he was implementing uh, uh, this new prime minister was implementing policy which were clearly not in the interest of the power that be. Um, these were economic, but also political, uh, and, and I would almost say cultural interest. And he was toppled by uh, uh, an intervention uh, uh, which uh, portrayed his government as causing a situation which was endangering the existence of the state. And there was a kind of silent, silent coup and, uh, and and then things came came back to normal. I don't even I can't even remember if it w he was assassinated or not or, or, or whatever what. It was in any case was uh, 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 the whole idea was that the government uh, 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 could be overturned in a fairly efficient, uh, non bl non too bloody manner. And, uh, and 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 then you can get a government. You can get an extremely uh, 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 extremely repressive government having all the tools mm -hmm. to. And that's what we have seen in the United States far more recently with Donald Trump. Donald Donald Trump. I mean, it's a complete nightmare if this guy comes back. Uh, uh, I tend to think he will not. But okay, uh, Donald Trump was well on his way. Of implementing a completely uh, uh, a completely different order in the United States, backed up by uh, 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 instruments of surveillance and, and control and repression, which were uh, 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 incredibly effective and, 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 and n no longer uh, uh, resistible. I mean, that's also a thing of technology. We uh, quite often you hear the thing that. Oh, if the Stasi only had the surveillance capacity that we have nowadays, it would never, uh, <laughs> the whole system would, would still be there. Optimists will say, no. Uh, uh, there's this psalm which says, empire raise and fall. Everything that raises will come down. <laughs> but <laughs> meanwhile, it's quite frightening. It's a quite frightening mm, prospect. Mm. Yeah, for sure. What about art in all of this? Yeah. Yeah, what uh, about art? Well, um, this exhibition that it's on now here at Mudum tries to tackle with these complexities, and I think uh, it's really hard for people, you know, working with materials and ideas to be able to compress so much into a sculpture or a video or, or an installation, whatever it may be. Um, I think uh, mm, what I'm asking myself is um, in this kind of political ecology, I think uh, we talk a lot about interest, commerce and financialization, that it's led by capitalism and by corporations. But I'm also personally very worried by the role culture doesn't play into this. Um, and it's quite interesting if you analyze a bit also how like Silicon Valley has been like moving along. I think culture has really been one of the places they colonized yeah. quite early on, um, say with the project of Google. Um, um, archiving, uh, owning the rights yeah. of yeah. all these artworks yeah. uh, with the idea that you could pixel by pixel, you know, experience them on your computer, but at the same time, you know, acqui acquiring, acquiring the possibility, yeah. the same yeah. with the yeah. uh, Bill Gates yeah. uh, owning the Getty images. And I think uh, uh, also the paywalls around universities yeah. uh, or mm. academic papers, yeah. um, this idea of 
inaccessibility and uh, yeah, um, kind of closing off rather than, than making shared because everything needs to be a profit. So um, yeah, I don't know if you have any take on this because I think culture is a bit always what is missing in this conversation because mm. yeah. it's easy to go to you know yeah, the yeah, technology to the or, or the effects. Right. Uh, yeah. And also it's what is missing in political discussions, you know, um, I mean, I'm taking the example of, of Italy with the lockdown, you know, they invested a lot of money to restart the economy. And of course, you know, there were huge, uh, huge problems in a lot of areas, health being, you know, what was perceived and it was the most important pressing issue but culture was always yeah, mm -hmm. culture was not there or was the very issues. last same step same in, same in France and I think you know this this is a big problem and I think you know empowerment to me is also this you know having more access uh, to information and I think culture or the right to culture is a big part of that now art is uh, I mean there's something unique about arts when it comes to these topics is that you can there's the capacity for artists to uh, to give one to give a story about the cyberspace with all these nuances. Doesn't have to be, you know, I'm pro technology, anti technology. It's art as it can can transcend that. It can it can project to you into one single piece of art the uh, the complexity, the paradoxes, the opposition, and you can really. So um, I'm I'm always very interested into when artists, you know, are taking the embracing this complex topic of uh, yeah cyber ethics, uh, what this means for knowledge, what this means for the future of the generation, and trying, you know, to, 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 to vehicle a message. So that's why I was, uh, that's why I was yeah, asking. Yeah, and I think maybe what's interesting in how artists approach this is that they, they don't represent anyone but themselves. Yeah. So yeah. they can really yeah, see through very different lenses and with their research go in very different directions. So maybe maybe that's that's what well it's, it's like any in infiltrating you know spaces right. yeah. that are we uh, l l last year we had sorry we had an event uh, it was uh, yeah november last year for the for the first year of the uh, of the institutes and we uh, invited artists to um, to produce some artwork you know on what what is cyber piece for them what does it mean and it was mind blowing yeah to because you know you you work on this every day but you work on this under the lens of uh, okay this is about attacks about victims about laws about norms so it, it frames uh, it's kind of super framed in my mind and then someone comes say okay what is yeah and about? maybe I mean uh, I'm generalizing and maybe romanticizing this a bit but I think art has always had this capacity of imagining futures and maybe the answer is somewhere there yeah. or at least they can they can prospect things that are not on the horizon True. yet True. just with their and I think a lot of also the cracks the problems as you were saying like the bias attached to algorithm because they come from human from intentions I think uh, there's really interesting artists like uh, developing work about that now like in the exhibition Martin Sims and Sandra Perry you know how algorithm disregard uh, black female bodies and how you know to take mm -hmm. back that space and like turn uh, I don't know Siri or Alexa yeah. into a different kind of uh, space and yeah, yeah I, I, I would even top up on that I think that at the moment the artists are the last one which are really have uh, uh, have uh, uh, are, are, are going quite far in understanding the whole issue, the whole, and, and are able to are able to portray it. It's uh, uh, there's a book which is called The Great Offshore. We we talked uh, uh, earlier about it, which is uh, done by the Brin Collective, uh, which is entirely has been it's entirely written by artists and. Uh, they really explain far better than <laughs> than any academics I know the economics working of the uh, of the situation we are we are now at the moment. The great offshore is about uh, about capitalism outsourcing itself in uh, uh, in in various location like uh, what we've known as uh, tax paradises mm -hmm. and so and. Uh, and uh, uh uh, and it's quite fantastic, and there are, there are there are many many instances of that. And the reason why you you were saying is it that they have that they are independent, they are not involved, they are not uh, how you call it. Uh, they don't um, have a specific stake. agenda. Yeah. A specific but this yeah. is 
you should watch out because this is changing also the whole artistic cultural field is now falling prey under this what i call the certification mechanism and the authorization uh, uh, thing that they also arts are going to be framed are being are going to be enclosed in uh, in the system i see it in in uh, in for instance in the netherlands in two uh, in, in, in two fields that artists are encouraged and encouraged is you should read for encouraged more or less forced or nudged as it is uh, <laughs> told now to uh, to uh, go for a PhD which is the absolute example of a certification uh, paper on one hand and on the other hand to behave like entrepreneurs so to become cultural entrepreneurs as it is uh, as it is called which is a way to include them in the system in the monetary capitalist system and but for the moment as far as they are resisting and when i was in academia i was noticing that theory was going out of academia in favor of basically money bringing in practical projects mm. Mm. in development uh, in, in the field of development development again between brackets in which i was it's very obvious because uh, 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 the department was basically functioning as a, as a resource knowledge resource base for the ministry of uh, uh, of foreign affairs and of development uh, things and um, theories was going out theory critical theory of development in my case in, in our case was going out but theory was moving to art schools because they were still they were still independent they were still outside the system i don't know if it's still if, if it's still the case i'm very afraid that if you go to an art school these days that uh, uh, they will say oh no no but this uh, this kind of field is no longer uh, is no longer uh, uh, financed is no longer uh, supported uh, well, uh, I mean, it's been it's been a while also for me, but um, I, I I sympathize with what you're saying because when I was uh, like studying in London, I went to Goldsmiths, which yes. you know prides itself as being a hotbed for theory and and thinkers, and it was quite interesting because you know they they kind of. Um, uh really uh, cherish their independence and uh, what happened as a student you have this you know kind of badge of honor that you graduated from there but then you're you're on your own and then you know the colleagues uh, from the other school that it's much more connected to institutions they were the one <laughs> getting the job yeah. yeah. or the internship you know so there's yeah. also that reality and i think uh, you know, artists have always been infiltrating spaces that are more, um, yeah, kind of borderless. But, you know, even in the 60s, there was in the UK the artist placement group and they were going into factories and, you know, like learning or making the other like forget about you know the the kind of tailorist the way of production yeah, 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 yeah. and nowadays like silicon valley does residences for artists and artists go there because yeah. they probably get five times the money they would get from a residency in a museum yeah. or yeah. you know an institution you know and the tools in a different way so True. it's it's a very complex uh, world to navigate as pirates yeah, or farmers. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I don't know what you think, but... Um, I think we covered quite some ground. Yeah. Spy for your freedom. <laughs> and there's still <laughs> so much ground to be covered. <laughs> and there are so many things to be discussed. But uh, nice conversation. Yeah, Very nice. Yeah, so... If everyone agrees, uh, we... Or this you uh, maybe I can plug... Yeah. Uh, 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 something because uh, you were quite at the beginning talking in terms of empowering uh, uh, people, and that's what you that's what your institution is doing. There are many more institutions uh, uh, doing that. Fortunately, I hope you also federate and know yeah, yeah, each yeah. other. I was, for instance, with the Tactical Technology Collective, which started as uh, that was when I was advocate of free and open source software, as I call it. Uh, and uh, um, uh, there is a group in Italy which is called Circe, which is doing exactly that. Uh, uh, they are giving classes to people 
Mais tu sais ça Internet mon amour, yes, I know this one. Tu sais ça, tu sais, mais tu sais le groupe aussi. Le groupe, non, 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 je sais le groupe. Et c'est tout à fait going to the people, going to classes in school and so, and explaining how technology mm -hmm. works and, and, and telling, telling kids, uh, uh, 14 years old kids, okay, you have a smartphone, do you know how it works? Uh, uh, well, it does this and this and that. Oh, oh, and if you do this, this and that happens. Mm. And, uh, you don't use apps, well, yeah, maybe uh, uh, some apps you can maybe use, but maybe others, uh, less so, because this and this and that, that is happening. And there are, uh, so there are, and, and it's, uh, yeah. That and uh, for the listeners out there, the book is Agnese Trocchi, Internet Mon Amour, Chronicles Before Yesterday's Collapse. <laughs> and there's a heart on the cover, a heart <laughs> that it's uh, technological <laughs> in scope, I mm. guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's uh, empowering, uh, uh, making people Attaining technological sovereignty. Yeah. That's, that's a bit, that's our hope. And it takes time, but it takes also like uh, willingness and again ambition from uh, uh, education program. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And mm. everyone, you know, so around school that, uh, that wants to have in, an, in another life. I, I, I wrote a play for that. It, that's, uh, that was played a lot in schools, in fact, to give, you know, like a really hands on story about what, what is happening when you just let go when you let technology drive everything and then you just let go and it works with kids. You, you, yeah. you, you always think that, you know, uh, there's no interest, uh, privacy is a value that they don't believe in anymore, whatever. It's not, it's not true at all. Yeah. It's, uh, it's even the contrary. I mean, yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite, I, I, I guess there's this kind of a misunderstanding about the millennials and the Z generation, whatever it's called now, uh, that they are like, uh, because they're digital natives, yeah. they understand yeah. digital. Yeah. It's absolutely untrue. It's very wrong. Totally they, uh, they have been raised to be, in fact, uh, manipulated by, uh, by digital means uh, and without really taking the time understanding how it works. Yeah, but but it doesn't mean that they don't have the capacity to or no. the curiosity to understand how it works. Well, they've been raised as consumers. Yeah, but you can make them producers. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and you can make them producers not by, having by imposing programs, by imposing curricula and so you can make them producers by explaining and by being an example mm. and by facilitating uh, by facilitating them and, uh, and so I'm, I'm yeah especially because you, you you see there's the um sometimes the meme you know the 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 the, 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 the meme generation makes me think about this it's, it's it's kind of hacking of the content mm -hmm. it's like you know the content that is passing by and you have this glimpse of joke and smartness to transform this content into something super fast, super fun for the whole community. Then what was originally the content is transformed into something else and, and then it, ge it gets a distance. So you understand that suddenly people get a distance in what is presenting to them, so it shows a bit of self-criticism also. And so the it, it's there. It's, it's really yeah, there. Uh, the, uh, we should not uh, mistake this generation to be blind consumer, yeah. but as long as they have an ambition to make them like really mm -hmm. informed consumer and to help them, exactly. what what can you what can you hope? Great. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Is there is there a password for us <laughs> to, to, to escape or <laughs> how does it work? I don't know. <laughs> Get escape us out the of bunker. the bunker. <laughs>